Is forgiveness enough or is something else required for inner peace or for harmony in our society? Is some kind of atonement or making amends necessary for long-term reconciliation between estranged people or warring factions? What if restorative justice replaced revenge and punishment as responses to hurtful and violent acts? Based on both his award-winning career and his extensive personal experiences, my guest today is eminently qualified to address those challenging questions. Hi, this is Marlena Fiol from Becoming Who We Truly Are, a YouTube show that deepens our understanding of who we are and also what's possible for us. If you find value in this video, please give it a thumbs up or click the subscribe button on your screen. It makes a big difference. Before introducing today's guest, who will talk a lot about becoming all that we can be, I invite you to check out two books that I've published about very imperfect people stumbling toward becoming their best and truest selves. My memoir, Nothing Bad Between Us, and also our new historical novel, Called. The website addresses are in the show notes below. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce my guest today, Phil Cousineau. Phil is an award-winning writer, filmmaker, teacher, editor, travel leader, storyteller, TV host. I mean, seriously, is there anything he hasn't done? Today, we're going to talk about a book Phil edited titled Beyond Forgiveness, Reflections on Atonement. It's actually a compilation of essays written by different authors, all suggesting that as indispensable and important as forgiveness is to the healing process, there's another equally profound thing that's needed for ultimate reconciliation, and that's atonement or making amends. Beyond Forgiveness shows how acts of atonement, like making amends or provide, providing restitution, can relieve us of the pain of the past and give us more hope for the future. I believe that forgiveness and reconciliation are important paths to healing and to finding our true selves. Over and over and in different ways, my guests address the question, what does it mean to forgive? Phil is uniquely qualified to explore this question along with other issues related to forgiveness and reconciliation. At the end of this brief interview, we'll provide recommendations of additional informative programs on forgiveness, reconciliation, and restorative justice. Phil, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Marlena. Thank you for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be discussing and exploring this topic again. As a way of introducing the book Beyond Forgiveness, would you tell us a bit about why did you pull together this particular set of authors to write about forgiveness, atonement, and reconciliation? Well, thank you for such a wonderful leading questions. I had just begun hosting and co-writing a show on Link TV and then PBS called Global Spirit, in which the conceit is that the producer... Stephen Olson and I select two or three guests from different corners of the world to explore one single topic for 57 minutes. And the second show in, we're talking about 10 years ago now, um, we had a, a show on forgiveness and healing. Not just forgiveness, but forgiveness and healing and a long-lasting healing. And we immediately came up with three marvelous guests. One was Azim Kamisa, an Iranian banker whose son had been murdered in a gangland um, initiation trial, actually. Mm. While he uh, first night out delivering pizzas, he was mm. shot and killed in an initiation of all things. Yeah. And this one single program, uh, Forgiveness and Healing, on our on our series, PBS, PBS is our global spirit, has been showing virtually ever since in all all corners of the world. Uh, it, it's shown in prisons, it's shown in psychotherapy sessions, and eventually a friend of Azim Kamisa's named Richard Meyer in Southern California contacted him that he had been pro profoundly moved by 
at this show and wondered if he could contact me. He did, and he asked me the great question that all authors love to hear, Marlena, do you think there's a book here? <laughs> this, is what, this is what we're all living to hear, right? <laughs> and single-handedly, he helped finance the entire two-year-long project, and we got a wonderful book deal with uh, John Wiley mm -hmm. Publishers, and yeah. the, the trick then was to find out how could we fill the book out, because what had come about in that one show and then initial conversations with Mr. Meyer and with Ed, Kate, and Azim is that forgiveness is only the first step. It's a profound step, but it can also be an easy step that in, in, does not go anywhere in terms of a deep, long-lasting reconciliation. Husbands and wives can can argue. People in a business environment can argue. Nations can argue about a border dispute and temporarily solve the problem. But if there isn't a second step, which is the phrase that Arun Gandhi, the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi himself, said, if there isn't the second step, then the peace that we have forged in our love life, at work, or <laughs> in nation building will dissipate like the morning dew. Now, this was something I felt I could see my teeth into because what an author is always asking, seriously, is does the world need one more book on such and such? Mm -hmm. And we do have a plethora of books about forgiveness, and, and, and that's actually a good thing. This one was, was different for me. And so I set about trying to, to get a kind of 360-degree view on forgiveness coming together with some form of deep reconciliation. One of the things that I announced in my preface in the book is that, so the book is probably 10 years old now, is that we are in the beginning, the exciting vanguard, if you will, of what is called in several communities restorative justice. Yeah. It's happening in, in indigenous communities virtually all around the world, and they have been practicing this for 40 or 50,000 years, if you count the aborigine culture in the way they deal with justice and injustice, and I do count them in there, but also Canada, New Zealand, Australia, some American court systems want to move beyond just punishment and retribution. And I am thrilled, Marlena, that our book has, has made a small dent in that. Were there any surprises as these chapters came together? Anything new that unexpected that you learned from the process of editing the book? Yes, that's, that's a great question. And what, I, what I've discovered is that virtually all indigenous tribes, especially the smaller they get, have some form of restorative justice involved, partly because of the mere size of the people. You can't, if you have a community of a few hundred people, you can't just exile somebody or put them in a, in a small jail, a hut, a nipa hut of some <laughs> kind. But, you have to deal with it right then and there. Your listeners probably know full well that America now has more people incarcerated than in any nation on the planet. And that means most people know someone who either is or has been in prison. Yeah. That is a blight on the cultural soul as yeah. far as I'm concerned. And what it means is we have had a system for a while of punish and put away. Why don't you get them out of my sight? Yeah. Phil, let's, let's go back a bit to the meaning of atonement. Uh, Powell writes that atonement is a state of mind. We're at one, at peace. Some of your other authors also define it as at one-ment. Would you say more about atonement, meaning we are at one? Yes, I'd be happy to. If your community is split because of a bitter, a bitter political fight, everyone will be at a kind of war until there was some attempt, some attempt to reconcile the conflicting views. We are fractured as individuals. We're, we are splintered as societies. See, these, often these are violent words we use to describe what happens when we get split asunder. Mm -hmm. My definition in the book, I'll, I'll, I'll read it because I, I worked on this a while. Atonement is an, uh, an act that rights a wrong, makes amends, repairs harm, offers restitution, attempts compensation, clears the conscience of the offender, relieves anger, 
for the victim or serves justice that is somehow, and here is the operative word here, is somehow commensurate with the harm that was done. Mm -hmm. See, the, the act of forgiveness is kind of going halfway and then stopping. But if let's say if you build a school, you are doing something that is on a, again, this is a kind of amorphous, but let's say psychologically commensurate with the damage that was done. Yeah. Yeah. Then, as the great Van Morrison says, then the healing can begin. Yeah. Arun Gandhi, the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, writes that forgiveness and atonement are two sides of the same coin. And he says one without the other doesn't mean much. But if we define atonement, as you just said, as being as one, is this even possible without forgiveness? Oh, no, it has to be both. In the, the interview that I did with uh, Mr. G Gandhi, which was a, a series of phone calls and long emails and uh, manuscripts going back and forth, and I just urged him to keep going deeper into what he learned from his grandfather. Mm -hmm. he, he, he ultimately came up with an image that he was not in the first uh, manuscript that he sent to me, which said, <laughs> the brief setup is, is funny and very moving. Roughly 12 years old, he's a bit of a juvenile delinquent in India, and his parents say, we are either going to send you to military school or send you to live with your grandfather for two years. What's it going to be? <laughs> so <laughs> in order to straighten out his young life, he chooses to live with his grandfather for two years. The Mahatma Gandhi, right? Yeah. So he goes and lives, and he remembers a, a conversation in which Gandhi described deep long-lasting soul or even culture healing reconciliation as being like two pillars holding up a roof. If you've only got the one, let's say just forgiveness, now it may it may hold up a roof for a while, right? <laughs> Depending on where you place it, but eventually it's going to teeter and collapse. You need the second pillar to hold up the roof. I love that. That's a great physical image to, de to describe it. The, the second part of that was that, um, can, can you read me his definition again? Could you hear that? that we'll he says that, that the forgiveness and atonement are two sides of the same coin. Right. Right. One without the other doesn't mean much. My, my thinking in asking you this question is that I, I, I think you have articulated really well why, and in the book, uh, your contributors have done a wonderful job explaining why forgiveness without atonement doesn't mean much. My question was, is atonement even possible without forgiveness? They are not equal so much because you, you you must have forgiveness to get to atonement. Is that correct? Yes, of okay. course. That's the first step. I, I should have m mentioned that to begin with. Exactly. This is very rich territory. We don't need to name any names, but we do know there have been some terrible sexual scandals in the world of sports, in the world of celebrity, movies, politics, all of those yeah. enormous public arenas in which and it tends to be men with a lot of power and money will, will leap all the way forward and say, well, I'll, send, I'll set up a fund yeah. for yeah. Uh, destitute mothers, something like that. And that is not well, atonement efforts. the way you're talking about it. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. It's more about uh, portfolios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what victims are always waiting for is that phrase, I am sorry, sorry, or I regret what I've done. Yeah. Some kind of, often uh, what I got in some of the interviews I did was, often you want to be in the presence of someone who hurt you. Mm. And you want to feel the gaze. Yeah. The gaze of remorse. Yeah. So to go right over and say, I'm going to build a, a, a hospital, to replace what I've done, but there's no sense of sorriness or forgiveness. You're, you're right. That feels empty. Yeah. It can feel empty both ways. So thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. The conflicts you describe in the preface are examples of fairly clear one-way transgressions, most notably apartheid. But it seems to me that many conflicts are a more complex blend of multiple layers of mutual wrongdoing and each party blaming the other. I'm wondering, how does that complicate the process of forgiveness, atonement, and reconciliation? It's a difficult question, which means a difficult answer. It is often 
I don't want to reduce it, but tit-for-tat violence, which we have seen in Mm Israel-Palestine, in Northern Ireland, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, even today as we speak, these endless cycles of violence Mm -hmm. in which um, there's bloodletting out of things like national pride. Someone, somewhere has to stop and say, we were wrong. You were wrong. This will never end until someone says, I'm going to put it, put the gun down. Someone says, uh, we have to rebuild, re- regain the world. No Irishmen were involved in the final, priest, final priest, peace process as for N- Northern Ireland. And virtually all of these women who ended up winning, winning the Nobel Prize had to say, someone has to say enough. Mm-hmm. Someone has to say, there is no future. What is that? Desmond Tutu's famous phrase, there is no future without forgiveness. Yeah. And that is, that is not a sappy phrase. It's not sentimental. It's a bedrock. It's a bedrock sensibility. And probably one of the hardest things in the world to do, because who doesn't have a resentment? Yes. Right? Yes. Who doesn't feel like they have stepped on and taken advantage of? But then you you kind of you deep breathe and you deep uh, breathe deeply, and you say, I "Can't wake up tomorrow morning feel feeling like this." However, if we do not learn how to do this in our relationships, in the workplace, in our political activism, a kind of soul rust sets in. Hmm. I like a that rust from the inside begins to rut out, rust out, and wh- what what happens? We- we become cynical, sarcastic, snarky is the modern word to describe this, and it's not a pretty sight. Yeah, I like that soul rust. This podcast season about forgiveness and reconciliation was motivated in part by my new book, which traces my own journey toward reconciliation with my father and with his Mennonite church. And we forgave and we reconciled, but we never sat down to talk about the pain or the abuse. Our journey toward reconciliation was more organic, maybe born from gradually realizing that we were both broken and imperfect. And Phil, you quote Houston Smith as saying, the power of the act of forgiveness is the recognition of the flaw in all of us. So here's my question. Is that recognition of the brokenness of all of us sufficient for reconciliation sometimes to emerge organically without even verbalizing the acts that need to be forgiven? That is so beautifully put. I wish I'd quoted you when I was working on the book. Oh, thank you. It's quite something because what it evokes is what I believe is the notion of presence, as in P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, sometimes it's just to sit and be quiet and to be in someone's presence. That is a kind of act all in of itself. Maybe that's what you needed or someone needed to do with your father to be in the presence. It's hard to do that in an email. It's hard to do this in a text. Michael Nagler writes that, in our society, closure in the criminal justice system is the satisfaction of seeing perpetrators suffer. And he says, this reflects a serious misunderstanding of what we want and who we are as humans. And so let me ask you, what form of closure do we seek fundamentally as human beings? Wholeness. Mm. That's why the word itself is so profound. I have a line, and this is coming back to me now, what what revenge does, it, it's an easy, instinctual, reflexive movement, and it's universal. Everybody has felt this one way or, or the other. But what it, if we do enact the retaliation or the, the revenge, we're buried in bitterness. Even after the retaliation, there is still some of that soul rust inside of us. Hate just immerses us in ever more anger. So it takes a conscientious and probably a spiritual effort to try to get over that. And why? Because if we're not whole, we lash out and we will hurt our children. We will hurt our neighbors. Uh, 
usually men will turn around and hurt their girlfriends or their 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 wives because all the, the anger cannot stay inside people lash out so this isn't an abstract this, this is not an abstract discussion yeah and how do we deal with the shame and the guilt that we carry um so many of my guests on this podcast whether it's in the context of family estrangement racial injustice rape have said that when we're focused on our own shame we get stuck in our, in the wound and it's not going to heal what is it about storytelling that makes it such a powerful tool for healing? Well, we tell stories in order to not feel alone. <laughs> we find ourselves by reading other stories. Mm, yeah. Going to plays to find out how others have been hurt and what they did with the hurt. How did they atone? How did they get through it? Or how did they self-destruct? Yeah. This yeah. is part, We've been doing this for, for millennia. And at the same time, we can't we can't forget that there has to be some lightness to it too. I remember Mother Teresa once saying, "People are illogical and they're self-centered." You know what? Forgive them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you t you talk about the importance of willingness and honesty in acts of atonement mm -hmm. that they, that they really do need to be performed willingly and honestly for it to lead to healing. And then a few pages later, you describe an Atlanta judge sentencing four white racist arsonists to rebuild the black church that they'd burned down. And this leads to my question, under what conditions may an ordered act of restitution lead to healing? I think this is a terrific question. Thank you for citing that. Um, two things about that. The, the, the most important is context. In some societies, let's say an, an indigenous tribe, where the, let's say the white man's law on the Navajo reservation just isn't working, so they have their own courts, their own ways of dealing with justice. So that Atlanta story would sit very well, let's say, in a Navajo court or mm -hmm. in New Zealand with the Maori people, mm -hmm. because they would say, well, of course, you give someone the opportunity to make up for something that they did that was either stupid or profoundly hurtful to someone. In our culture, it's a little trickier because we really have been based since the founding of this, of this nation on revenge. Yeah. And it's why we have more prisons and more death sentences than any culture possibly in, in human history. So we have to be careful about the, the business of this slow, steady emergence of what's called a restorative justice. I think this was ingenious. The Atlanta judge, the world isn't going to be a better place by sending these, these, these guys to prison for 20 years. Mm -hmm. They are dramatizing the act of atonement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, how deep that sits in, I don't think we know yet. Phil, if there were one last thing you'd like our listeners to hear, what would that be? Joseph Campbell, the great scholar, says, the great mystery is if we are separate from each other and we are meant to be brutes, and there are whole streams of psychology and philosophy that says, well, everybody's out for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. No one is really, there is no such thing as altruism. However, why is it that in a moment of war, a hand grenade is thrown into a trench and a soldier will look at his best friends, her mates in that trench and throw herself on the grenade? Mm -hmm. People do this. Mm -hmm. Or the equivalent, running in front of a bus to save a kid who is in a stroller that was released by the par horrified parent on the curb. People will risk themselves. And Joe's question is why? And I can still hear the beautiful cadence in his voice when he gave me the answer on camera. It's because we know at the end of the day, we are one. one. If you don't throw yourself on that grenade, if you don't save that child in the middle of the street, if you don't give some money to the to the elder who doesn't have money for food 
at the end of the month. If you don't do that, we will never feel the sense that we are deeply and profoundly one. This has been real and thought-provoking, and we're out of time. Phil, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. I appreciate it. I appreciate you giving a deep read to the book and asking deeply thought out questions that <laughs> helps make a true conversation. If you have found value in this program, please do give it a thumbs up and click that subscribe button on your screen. It really does matter. And if you'd like to listen to my hour long interview with Phil Kuzno, the web address can be found in the show notes below. In addition, just so you know, I'll be posting a new episode of this YouTube show each Tuesday morning at 6 Eastern Time. Also, please post any comments or questions you may have for me. I am interested and I will respond promptly. For example, have you reconciled with people who have harmed you in the past? Why or why not? For those of you who are deeply engaged in your own quest to becoming who you truly are, my path may not be the best path for you. It's been a way for me to move forward and find increasing levels of peace, but really only you know what path is best for you. For further information on forgiveness, reconciliation, and restorative justice, we recommend the following resources. A TEDx presentation by Sammy Rangel, on the power of forgiveness. Also, a TEDx talk by Katie Hutchinson on restorative practices to resolve conflict, build relationships. And finally, for a look at my own journey from brokenness toward becoming my truer self, we recommend my memoir, Nothing Bad Between Us, as well as our new historical novel called. The web addresses of each of these are in the show notes. And remember, we are together on this journey. Thank you.